Luke 14. You know, one of the struggles that parents have is that they're concerned about their kids having a good attitude. You know, how many times you that are parents have said this to your kids? Now, I need you to change your attitude or we're not going at all. (laughs) Anybody ever said that? Hands up out there. Lots of us have said that. And sometimes it's hard to tell them exactly what the attitude is that we're looking for. All we know in that moment is it isn't what we're seeing right now. So that's the, the difference um, there. Can I get an amen for that? I trust that you parents out there are saying amen right now, even though I can't hear you. I bring that up because God is looking for the right kind of attitude also. And I titled this message, The Right Kind of Attitude, because Jesus is going to call out some guys here who don't have the right kind of attitude because he wants the readers here and those that are there present in the moment to have the right kind of attitude towards God and to others. And so what he does, which is so creative, is he rebukes the wrong ones. And what he's looking for, and really the whole section that we're going to go through here today, is what he's looking for is humility. (laughs) Humble ourselves before God and one another. Because if you think about it, humility shows up, or lack of humility shows up in, in who we care about in how we think, and what we do. And ultimately, really, what we find out is that what the Lord is pointing us to is what he does himself, that he's the example of humility. And so we'll see and learn from his example as we go through this and keep pointing it back to our humble Savior and who he is as his, and just yielding himself to the will of the Father. So I'm going to take you through three kinds of attitudes here that we see in these parables that Jesus is going to teach. The first one, we're going to be taught uh, to be humble enough to care like Jesus, that we wouldn't be exclusive and ignore the needs of others. We'd be humble enough to care. Number two, we're going to look at uh, the right kind of attitude is be humble enough to yield to God like Jesus and and, you know, to not be a prideful person where he's going to show us that and the example of these guys that are so prideful. And then third in our outline today, we're going to be shown to be humble enough to go when the Lord calls that we would go and wouldn't wouldn't have excuses. So all that said, uh, let's begin here with number one in our outline. And I call it be humble enough to care like Jesus. Let's start in verse one. This is what Luke said. Now it happened. As Jesus went into the house of one of the rulers of the Pharisees to eat bread on the Sabbath, that they watched him closely. Okay, so uh, the, the Pharisees were very antagonistic towards Jesus. They were these very religious people uh, whose actions and attitudes didn't line up with the heart of God. But as we see here, the Lord still associates with them. Obviously, he's not one of them, or he's not like them, or he doesn't approve of of what they're doing, but he still spends time with them because that's how God loves people, is he's still around them, uh, even if he doesn't approve of what they're doing. And and Jesus wants to show them a godly example and, and show them God's grace and so forth. But we see these guys, they're just watching him like a hawk. And the reason why they're doing it is to find some kind of a fault in him, which is a a dead end for them because they'll never find fault with Jesus. But that's the heart of the matter. That's what they're trying to do. And the reason is because Jesus was known to break their traditions. Jesus never broke the law of God. He always kept the law. He fulfilled the law of God, but he would violate some of the things that these guys saw as their traditions, right? Even though they kind of confused it with the law, that was what they had a problem with uh, mostly. So they, they watched him closely to see how he reacted. Isn't that really what Christians go through today too? In varying levels, we're under constant scrutiny from the world as to how we're going to respond to things. When you became a Christian, that's really part of your job description, 
You, you didn't notice it, but it was in the fine print. There will be constant scrutiny <laughs> of your life to varying uh, degrees because, and the Lord allows this. It's actually good as, because uh, we're his ambassadors that he wants people to see Jesus in us. And so he allows this to go on. It's been said that we are the only Bible that many people will ever read. And there's some truth to that. And so as we come to sections like this in the Bible, it's a blessing for us to learn how to humble ourselves before God so people will see that instead of who we used to be. Their objective was not to learn from Jesus, but they're trying to find something that they disagree with. And there's a lot of that going on in the world too. So all that said, despite all this opposition, Jesus still goes there. And here's what happened. Look at verse two and three. He says, and behold, there was a certain man before him who had dropsy and Jesus answering spoke to the lawyers and Pharisees saying, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? Okay. So there's a man there at this guy's house and he has a serious disease. Uh, it's, this one is known to have a really dangerous swelling inside a body and it, it could be deadly. But as we see here, Jesus cares about him and he, and that's why he, he raises this and why he's going to heal him because he cares about him. Now he asks a question of these guys, these religious leaders of Israel, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? Now he asked it because to them, it isn't lawful to heal on the Sabbath. Their tradition was that they would try to prevent death if somebody was seriously injured. But it was against their tradition to do anything beyond that. Like anything involving any sort of like healing, putting ointment on things or whatever it was called. Anything beyond a life-saving measure had to wait until the next day. So not on the Sabbath, we're not doing any healing, right? And that's how they believed in it. It was written in their their tradition, and so forth. So Jesus asks them, hey, is it lawful to heal this guy on the Sabbath? Well, how do they respond? Look at verse four. But they did what? They kept silent. And so Jesus took him and healed him and let him go. Then he answered them saying, which of you having a donkey or an ox that has fallen into a pit will not immediately pull him out on the Sabbath day? And they could not answer him regarding these things. You know why they didn't say anything? Because they're not humble enough to care. They only care about themselves. And so we see here the other side of things, and that's Jesus, who's our example. That's who we follow. And the Lord cares for people who are in difficult situations. I teach from the New King James Version uh, of the Bible, and there's lots of other good versions. Some of the other versions have it written differently here, where it says, which are you having a donkey or an ox? Like, for example, if you have a ESV Bible, it says a son or an ox. Because the translation from the Greek words into English, some see it as, as it says, son, some say as a donkey. We're not sure exactly which one it is or what happened there. But all that to say, the idea is the same. Think about it this way. Something important to you is in jeopardy. So what are you going to do? Are you just going to look in the pit and say, sorry, <laughs> You're just going to have to wait till tomorrow. <laughs> we'll get you out then, you know, whether it's a son, a child, or a, a donkey. Now, is that what people would actually do? No way. Nobody would do that, especially if your animal is your moneymaker. <laughs> Nobody's going to leave it in there. And that's why he asked the question. You see, the problem here is this. God never said in the law, don't help people on the Sabbath day. God never said, don't rescue your animal if it's, life is in jeopardy. He didn't say that. He told them in the law not to work on the Sabbath day. He told them to rest. He told them to worship him on that day. But then the religious people, they started to add all these traditions on top of the basic, simple law of just not working. 
And so when you add all that other stuff on it, it's just a man thing and it's empty. And that's a big problem. I went to dinner once when I uh, worked in the corporate world and we went with like a group dinner with a bunch of people and uh, two of the guys at the dinner were, were Muslim guys. It was their day of fasting that they do on a regular basis as part of their religion and their, their fasting apparently was coming to an end around the same time that we had our dinner that night. It was about six o'clock. So they had this religion that required them to fast on a regular basis in order to be accepted by that, by their God and so forth. And so our group, we all ordered dinner together and then the food started coming and so forth and, and, and we all start eating. And it's like five to six, if I remember all right. And these guys can't eat yet. And so their food's sitting in front of them and what they're doing is they're looking at their watch and they're looking at their food and looking at their watch, looking at their food and they actually start counting down. <laughs> like, what's oh, five to, okay, now one minute to go, one minute to go, you know, and then they, they literally did 10, nine eight, and you know three two one and then rah, 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 and, tight, and like really mowed down uh the food and so forth and it was just a really bizarre moment for me watching i was sitting next to one of the guys and i'm like why are you doing that to yourself well it's our religion and i was like well but what what does doing it like that do for you really well it's just an example because god knew that people are going to be like this. I mean, I think that people are very religious naturally. We want to like do something. Uh, the New Testament, a lot of the New Testament teaches against this. I saw in the book of Colossians, Paul is teaching about when you're in Christ, that you don't need to subject yourself to a bunch of regulations. He calls them the doctrines of men. You see, they're not the doctrines of God. They're stuff that we layer on top, just like the Pharisees did, to try and be more acceptable to God or to, to short circuit what God requires of people, and that's faith in his son, Jesus. I wanted to read to you Colossians 2.23, and we'll put it on the screen for you, because look how Paul points out the folly of this. He says, these things indeed have an appearance of wisdom, in self-imposed religion, false humility, and neglect of the body, but are of no value against the indulgence of the flesh. Wow. See that? This is a, a verse worth memorizing because this is a common problem that human beings have. In other words, if I could paraphrase for Paul there, it's like what the person is doing looks like it will work <laughs> because it's like, doing something to try and make themselves better or whatever. And others are actually fooled into thinking that we're more spiritual when we do it. But in reality, Paul just said that it doesn't do anything about our sin nature and doesn't improve us. He called it false humility. I'm reminded by this when I read it, that if this doesn't work, then what should we do? Well, the Bible teaches that our best defense is offense. And our best defense when it comes to these things, if you want to be more like Jesus, then walk in the Spirit. Because the Bible says that if I will walk in the Spirit, I will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. We go on the offense instead of just like trying not to do things or making rules and putting all these regulations upon ourselves and others, that we would seek the Lord and ask him to fill us with his power, the power of the spirit, and to fill us with his truth, that we'd be reading our Bible, that we would want to experience more of God's grace. And that's walking in the spirit, those kind of things. And then I won't fulfill the lust of the flesh. So our study here today of the right kind of attitude, uh, we saw in the first example here that Jesus gave us that we want to be humble enough to care about the plight of people and not just be selfish like those guys. They are very exclusive. And that isn't a humble life uh, as the Lord would have us leave. The example is like Jesus, right? Because he cared about that man. He healed him. Number two of second right kind of attitude, and I call this one, be humble enough to yield. Be humble enough to yield. Again, the example is like Jesus. 
and to not be prideful. We're going to see these guys are prideful. It'll be like them. Verse 7 says, So Jesus told a parable to those who were invited when he noted how they chose the best places. Okay? You have to understand that they had a hierarchy system amongst the, the Jewish leaders there, and some of the seats around the, the dinner table would have more honor than others. You know, just like today, the head of the table is kind of like the, the seat with the most honor to us, I guess you could say. Well, there they had several of them, and they were kind of like in a caste system, if you if you would say. It was kind of like I was invited to a police department uh, recently, uh, and there was I went to a briefing of the officers, and <laughs> the person who invited me to the briefing before the officers showed up, he told me where not to sit. <laughs> And he started to go around. Now, see that seat over there? Don't sit there because that's where the lieutenant sits. And don't go, don't go there because that's where the watch commander is. You know, and that was those kind of things. Now, to me, all the seats looked the same. <laughs> but they had this, like, unspoken order of who went where. So you just go over there in the back and so forth. Well, the Jewish leadership was like that only more. They wanted the best seats, right? Because to them, that showed that they had status and had preferential treatment and those kind of things. So Jesus, of course, knows that. And so here's what he tells them to do about it. Verse 8 says, When you are invited by anyone to a wedding feast, do not sit down in the best place, lest one more honorable than you be invited by him. And he who invited you and him come and say to you, Give place to this man. And then you begin with shame to take the lowest place. Boy, there's nothing worse than that walk of shame, right? And he's going to show you can avoid all this with just a little bit of humility. But look at, with me at verse 10. He says, when you are invited, go sit down in the lowest place so that when he who invited you comes, he may say to you, friend, go up higher. Then you will have glory in the presence of those who sit at the table with you. Okay, this is common sense. If you take the low place, then there's no place to go but what? To go but up, right? Right, makes a lot of sense. But in our natural thinking, we don't think like that. And yet Jesus is making a lot of sense here. Obviously, it's a spiritual thing that he's teaching, but it's also common sense kind of a thing that's going on here. Take the low place, and you go up. Uh, My wife and I, we went to this big banquet we were invited to, and we got there, and it was filled with people. And we got there a little bit late, and so the the places to sit were minimal, right? And so someone who is at, like, the desk when you get there, or the table when you get to the banquet, they're like, yeah, you're going to have to take one of those seats in the back there because that's the only seats that are available right now. And so, like, well, okay, you know, we kind of figured that would be the case anyway because you're kind of late. So we get there and we go sit in the back and we're kind of like looking, the stage is over there, I think, someplace like that. And, and we start chatting up the people around our table. And while we're sitting there, then the person who is in charge of the whole banquet comes up to us and goes, hey, no, 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 you're not sitting at this table. You're up at, at our head table with us. And so, of course, that's a great moment to have. So you're getting up, and while we're walking up the front, I kept thinking of, I must be in the front row, <laughs> you know, that kind of Bob Euchre thing. And so, you know, walking up there, and it's because they were inviting us up to that other place. Now, this whole thing is a metaphor for God's kingdom. You see, the Lord, what he's trying to get us to understand is promotion, real promotion, comes from the Lord. And that should be what we desire. And in order to actually have that, we have to humble ourselves before him. Because the problem with these dudes is that they're more interested in sitting in the right seat, where Jesus is more interested that we're the right kind of person. (laughs) And it gets all messed up if we don't receive that. So you might be thinking, well, how do I yield like this in everyday life as a believer? Because we're all the same, aren't we? I mean, when when we see the pizza box open, we want the best slice of pizza, don't we? When you go into a restaurant, we all want the best seat in the restaurant. It's just like who we are. We all want to be treated very well. So what, what do we do about that? I heard somebody say one time, when I know I am loved, I don't have to win all the time. 
And this is a very helpful thing to remember. When I know I'm loved, I don't have to win all the time. Because the more that we understand and just can accept and receive God's love, it becomes easier to comply with these things. It's easier to be last or lowest, you see. I mean, think about it. God treats us better than anybody does. God's love is better than anything else that I can have. And so when you know that that's what you're getting, then it's going to be okay. It's like, God loves me. He's going to take care of this later. And Jesus actually talks about that as we go. And so those of us adults who are willing to go sit at the kids' table (laughs) will have more waiting for us later on. And that's why he says this next. And this is the key verse of our Bible study today. So let's pay attention. Verse 11, it says, For whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. Would you guys say that with me? Whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. If you like to memorize verses in your Bible, this is a really good memory verse for you and I, that just that it would sink in and we could have that with us and carry it in our heart all the time because this is the lesson of the parable right here. And that's that God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. And that's the message of the scriptures, really, encapsulated in one little verse. He resists people who are prideful like the Pharisees, but gives grace to those of us who will yield to him. And of course, again, Jesus is the perfect example of this. His whole life is yielding and the right attitude before God and man. That's why here he doesn't shame these guys, (laughs) even though they probably deserved it, right? You know, they're just, they're being jerks about everything. But his objective was to save them, not to shame them. So he doesn't shame them. He's just warning them. Look, don't exalt yourself because it's not going to turn out well for you. Because the end is ruin. You know, there's a lot of examples of the danger of false humility, pride in the scriptures, those who resist humility and and are prideful. Uh, One example came across is in the Old Testament book of Daniel. Daniel chapter 5, you can check this out for yourself later, but there was a king, the grandson of Nebuchadnezzar, a guy named Belshazzar. And this king, the Jewish people were in captivity in Babylon, and he was the ruling king uh, at this particular time when that chapter was written. And one night, he decided that he was going to have a drunken party to just celebrate his kingdom and, and so forth. And so what they did is they took out all the, the cups and the goblets and so forth that they had uh, ransacked from the temple in Jerusalem many years before. And getting drunk, drinking out of all the goblet and everything. And they were praising their false gods and mocking the Lord. And, and so while this party is going on, God's hand or a hand wrote a message to Belshazzar on the wall of his palace. And it scared him so much, but he couldn't understand what the message said. So he called for the one guy in the whole kingdom, a Jewish guy named Daniel, to interpret what the message was. And this is what Daniel told him. And I'm just going to paraphrase. He, he, he basically said, Belshit King, you have not humbled your heart before God. As a matter of fact, you've lifted yourself up against the Lord of heaven. And because of that, you are done for. And we know from that story that he died that very night. And his kingdom was lost to uh, the Medo-Persian Empire. And Jesus knows what he's talking about here. Pride leads to ruin. On the other hand, there's other people in the Bible who do humble themselves and God exalt them. An example would be Saul of Tarsus. You know, he was this guy who was a very proud Pharisee who one day in the midst of persecuting Christians, he met Jesus on a road. And because of the glory of the Lord and the truth that he experienced, he decided, I'm going to humble myself before him. And it changed his life. It changed his eternity. And it's changed our whole world that he would do that. And he has a, a prominent place in God's kingdom because 
he did that. And so, good verse to remember, whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. Well, Jesus continues in the teaching here in verse 12, and let's read through verse 14. He said, then Jesus also said to him who invited him, when you give a dinner or a supper, do not ask your friends, your brothers, your relatives, nor rich neighbors, lest they also invite you back and you be repaid. But when you give a feast, invite the poor, the maimed, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed because they cannot repay you. For you shall be repaid at the resurrection of the just. Wow, it's great. You know, the Pharisees were known to go to feast just to be honored. And they like the prestige. They like the notoriety and rabbi, rabbi, come sit over here, you know, that kind of a thing. And, and so they usually associated with people who could do that for them. And that's obviously a problem in many circles, folks being exclusive or just, you know, only wanting to be where they can, you know, like picture a celebrity only going where someone is going to honor them and, and that kind of thing. But true faith, Jesus teaches does things without wanting to gain from it. They didn't have true faith, at least most of them. The natural way, and that's who they are, and and the natural way of people is, what can I get out of it? You know, how will this benefit me? But the right attitude is, how can I yield to God so I can minister to other people? So he can do what he wants to do. Now, sometimes people are afraid that they're not going to get theirs, and that's why they act a way that's against what God wants them to do. But did you see what the tag was there on verse 14? It's so important. He tells us that we will be repaid by God. You can't outgive God. And so he's going to take care of this. We don't have to worry about getting paid, paid back. He'll, he'll just take care of it later. I'm reading in the book of Acts on my own time with the Lord in the morning. And I just read Acts 24 the other day. And Paul, the apostle there, who was Saul of Tarsus, and he became the apostle Paul when he got saved. He said that there's going to be a resurrection of the just and the unjust. That is the believers and the non-believers. And this is something that's talked about a lot in the Bible. The just or the believers are going to be raised to everlasting life. The unjust are going to be raised to everlasting contempt or, or judgment. And so here Jesus is letting us know that not only will believers be raised to everlasting life, but we will also be rewarded for our faithfulness. <laughs> And this is a common repeated theme in the Bible, too. That God will not be outgiven by any person. And so the exhortation here is to do things for those who can't repay you, and God will take care of the rest. Just do it for the Lord. What a great lesson to learn. If you've been in ministry at any time, you know what I'm talking about. We, we have to do it for the Lord and not worry about the outcome. Again, my wife and I were uh, years ago doing nursing home ministry, and we would go and visit elderly people in homes and do little church services for them. And at one time, he started to show us that this was really good for us because the elderly in these homes couldn't do anything for us. And it was, you know, just a good lesson to learn. They couldn't repay us is what I would, a better way to describe it. They they would never come to our church. <laughs> They couldn't give us anything, even though these little old ladies would try to like stuff a dollar in my pocket sometimes and stuff like that. These people could barely stay awake for my Bible teaching. (laughs) But you know what? God blessed us so much, so much so that it changed our life to show us that we just want to serve him and let him take care of the rest. So the the lesson here is to seek honor from God. (laughs) And more than people, be like Jesus. He said that to be humble enough to yield to him and just see what he would do through that. Well, the third right attitude, this is the last one in my uh, outline here this morning, is be humble enough to go. (laughs) Be humble enough to go. Go with Jesus. Uh, Most of this has been taught, I think, uh, towards the Christians. And I'm speaking to my brothers and sisters in the Lord. This last section is geared towards those who don't know the Lord yet. So if that's you, 
If you wouldn't call yourself a Christian, if you wouldn't say that you've received Christ, that you've been born again by his spirit, then maybe uh, it's time for you to just pay attention a little more than before and see what God would say to you, okay? So let's look in verse 15. It says, Now when one of those who sat at the table with him heard these things, he said to Jesus, Blessed is he who shall eat bread in the kingdom of God. Okay. Have you noticed that people like to shout things out when Jesus is around? <laughs> this keeps happening through the book of Luke. It's, it's happened many times before. Like remember early in the book that somebody yelled, blessed is the woman who gave birth to you. Talking about Mary and a few chapters ago, it was, hey, tell my brother to share the inheritance with me that we just got from our dad or whatever. And like people just like shouting things out in these crowds. They must think it's like a, a Bernie Sanders rally or something. Free health care for all. Like <laughs> something, you know, it's like weird. So this guy says, blessed is he who shall eat bread in the kingdom of God. It's like he's saying, boy, it's going to be great when we all get there. As we go, this is a perfect time for Jesus to have said, yep, right on, man. We're all going to be blessed when we get there. Except he doesn't say that. He's actually going to teach such an important thing for us to know. And that's, are you sure that you will be there? So let's find out if we will. Verse 16. He says, then Jesus said to him, a certain man gave a great supper and invited many and sent his servant at supper time to say to those who were invited, come for all things are now ready. But they all with one accord began to make excuses. The first said to him, I have bought a piece of ground and I must go and see it. I ask you to have me excused. All right. So Jesus brings up another feast that's coming in the future. (laughs) This is a parable (laughs) of another feast that's coming. And the parable here, well, let's just talk about what the parable means. The man in the parable is God. The servant is likely Jesus himself, and the supper is that party, that that wedding feast, that eternal life, that idea that you and I, the truth, that we will be with him in glory if we've put our trust in Christ. And so the invitation to that goes out. It goes out to the world, and we're told there that, you know, you'd think everybody would rush in, (laughs) but some, lots actually, probably speaking to those people at the table, start making excuses. And Jesus is going to mention three common excuses that I wanted to draw out of this. The first one there is possessions, right? He said, I bought some land and I need to go take care of it. And of course, there's nothing wrong with having things, you know, in this case, like property. But if it keeps you out of heaven, then it's a huge problem, isn't it? So this person, and the point is, he's more occupied with stuff than with God. And that's obviously a dangerous place to be. The second excuse is in verse 19. Let's look at that one. He said, and and another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen and I am going to test them. I ask you to have me excused. Okay, so now this excuse is job or business related. Sorry, I got to (laughs) work. And you know, it... This is a common one because working and earning a living are good things, aren't they? You know, we're told in the scriptures to work and it's a necessary thing for us to do. And so unfortunately, when it's a necessary thing, some people think that they get an automatic pass from God because of it. Well, I got to work, so I can't seek the Lord, you know, that kind of a, a thing. But that's the wrong attitude. We don't live for work. We live for the Lord. But again, hear the response from this person to the invitation is no thanks. I'm busy. Well, there's one more excuse. Number three in verse 20. Still another said, I have married a wife and therefore I cannot come. Okay, this one is family or relationships and they can be a big barrier sometimes. My husband isn't interested, so I can't. My wife is doesn't want to, so I can't. You know, I I knew a guy once who said that very thing to me. People say, well, I'll, we're going to raise our kids first, and then we'll get serious about our relationship with God. Do you know that the best thing that you can do for your family is to put Jesus first in your life? 
It's the best thing that you can do. It's the best thing that I can do. But what many people do is they'll put a boyfriend first or a girlfriend and they'll put them in front of their salvation. And it's frightening for that person. I don't have time for all that. And it's just all these excuses. So for all three of these, the issue really is that they're preoccupied with them. And here's what John Trapp, a preacher from a long time ago, said. He said, worldliness is a great hindrance to heaven. And boy, is it. The real reason these people are making excuses is because they don't want to go. They don't want to go on Lord's terms. So how does he respond to those excuses? Verse 21, so that servant came and reported these things to his master. Then the master of the house, being angry, said to his servant, go out quickly into the streets and lanes of the city and bring in here the poor and the maimed and the lame and the blind. (laughs) Did you notice that in the parable, he's doing what Jesus told the Pharisee to do back in verse 13? In other words, this is what God does. Be like him because it's the best way to be. It's the best attitude. (laughs) Care about people cast the net out and find people who really want to be there you know in that day they considered people with disabilities to be lesser human beings but obviously god doesn't see them like that he's going to fill his kingdom with people like that well the servant in verse 22 said master it is done as you commanded and still there is room then the master said to the servant go out into the highways and hedges and compel them to come in that my house may be filled (laughs) you know compel that's like convince (laughs) convince them to come in the tragedy that we're finding out here is that if you make excuses you're going to lose your seat to someone else because god's going to fill it but why do that there's lots of room (laughs) he wants to fill his house remember that song we used to sing it's a big big house I was just reading the, the statistics that, you know, the, the New Jerusalem, just the holy city in heaven is 1,500 mile cube. 1,500 miles by 1,500 miles by 1,500 miles. Like, it can hold, if you do the calculations, billions of people comfortably. There's lots of room. And so the Lord sends out the invitation. He wants them to come. There's plenty uh, of room. Well, I'm going to finish here with a warning here from jesus and here's what he says in verse 24 for i say to you that none of these men who were invited shall taste my supper all right so what did he do here he got back around to the guy's comment remember in verse 15 he said blessed are those who go to the dinner in the kingdom of god right well according to jesus most of those guys aren't going to be there because they don't go in his way lots of people have a false assumption about their eternal destiny. I just saw a statistic the other day that 85% of Americans think they're going to heaven. Well, I hope they do, but many won't. And the Bible says they won't because the gate is narrow. They won't go God's way through faith in his son, Jesus Christ. And so if they won't, he turns to those who will. And so now we're invited. (laughs) We're invited. There's plenty of room, as I said. You just have to accept the invitation. One of the last things that we're told in the Bible is that whoever desires can come. So let me ask you, is that you? Would you come to Jesus? Hopefully you're not one of these, like these guys here that are making excuses why you can't. If you have been making excuses, now would be a good time to turn. And I just want to urge you to seek God and ask him for forgiveness, that you would put your trust in his son jesus that you would turn to him by faith the bible calls it to repent to repent from your sin and turn to god ask him to forgive you might just say something like lord i believe in your son jesus i believe that he rose from the dead i believe that you sent him to forgive me for my sins i ask you to welcome me into your family and i want to be at the banquet table at the party in heaven will you save my soul and and god loves to save people like you who will put their trust in him so i pray that not only that you have done that but that those of you who know christ already uh, have gained a better perspective of the right sort of attitudes right and and the attitude that the lord is after supreme is humility (laughs) it's the most important thing to love him to yield to him as we saw to care about others 
and to have the faith to go when he calls and, and, and yield to him with our life. I would, as we close with this song, I would just ask uh, the Lord to bless you this week and encourage you as you go. If you have questions or comments for our church, you can reach out to our church office this week. You contact us if you need prayer. You could put it, post it on our Facebook uh, community page or contact our church through email or phone calls this week. We want to be here for you. And we just ask, uh, we just pray that God will bless you this week and God's grace be with you.